Because I'm going to talk to you tonight about the deity of Jesus Christ. Okay? I am going to talk to you about our third fundamental tenet of our faith at this church. And it is that we believe Jesus was and is the Son of God. Okay? Now, we've already been over the Scripture and that we believe the Bible is the inspired Word of God. And then in the second week, we went over how we believed He was the one true God. Last week, Pastor Paul preached a message on the Holy Spirit and the baptism of the Holy Spirit with the physical evidence of a personal prayer language. And that's just our verbiage. I could say the Holy Ghost and speaking in tongues. But... I, I can say the Holy Spirit in a personal prayer language and not weird everybody out. At the same time, it's, it's healthy. So we had that message. And, and you know what? I'm, I'm really sensing that I will probably go back to that message here in a couple of weeks. Not to scare anybody off, but just to reiterate and to reteach. It's one of our fundamental faiths. It's something that we believe in. It was something that I personally practice and believe is available to every single person who has ever received salvation. So we're going to come back to that. But tonight I want to talk to you about the deity of Jesus Christ, that he was and is the Son of God. Now before I do that, I want to kind of reprove the Word of God. And I'm going to give you this long statement that I heard and kind of reworded for myself. But the Word of God is the Bible, the Holy Bible. Okay? I want to talk to you just for a few seconds on the, the accuracy of Scripture and the Holy Bible. Now, some of this can be found. There's a really good movie that you can watch on this topic. There's an even better book. But if you're a movie person and not a book person, hi, I'm Chris, join the club and watch the movie. It's actually on Netflix. It's called The Case for Christ. It's the story of Lee Strobel. Lee Strobel was an atheist that set out to prove that the Bible wasn't true. And Jesus was not being completely honest when he said he was Lord. And in this movie, he ends up convincing himself to receive salvation. It's a very good movie. I watched it with my eight-year-old. It raised a lot of questions, and, and we had some great conversation. It would probably allow you to have some conversation. We're going to discuss some of that. In one of the scenes of this movie, Lee Strobel actually runs into uh, a Catholic priest uh, who used to be uh, um, a historian and uh, archaeologist, and he gave that up to serve God in vocational ministry. And in this scene, he begins to make some, some, some comparisons that I'm going to bring up tonight. But before I go there, here's what I want to need you to understand. The Bible, okay, this is the long, hopefully power statement, but is a little bit drawn out. The Bible is a reliable collection of historically accurate documents, okay? A reliable collection of historically accurate accurate documents, many of which were written by eyewitnesses in the presence of other eyewitnesses. They report supernatural events. I'm going slow because I want you to get this. These things that were written by these eyewitnesses in the presence of more eyewitnesses, they report supernatural, supernatural events that actually fulfilled specific prophecies in that Bible. These prophecies were not made up by man, but they were divine in power. So a reliable, historically accurate, written by eyewitnesses in the presence of other eyewitnesses. That's a big deal. They report not natural, but super natural events, many of which were the fulfillment of specific prophecies, not given by humans, but divine in power, divine, okay? That's who we are reading about. That is the word of God. That is the scripture. Now we're going to break that down a little bit. And I actually have, uh, this is from 
Josh McDowell uh, webpage, josh.org. I didn't even know that you could buy your name.org, but Josh McDowell did it. Josh McDowell uh, has since received his PhD recently, and he coordinated with another professor, an archaeologist, historian, and they created this PDF, okay? And on page 7 of this PDF, if we have that, if not, you're just going to have to listen really close. We actually have a more current, it's not completely current, but a more current breakdown of how many historical documents we actually have. Okay, So for instance, we have historical documents on Homer's Iliad. Okay. That, that historians and professors and philosophers across this nation teach as truth and fact. And they don't deny what Homer said, why he said it, and, and, and the reasoning behind all the things that he said. They do the same thing with Aristotle. They do the same thing with Plato. Nobody. They do the same thing with Socrates. Nobody questions the historical accuracy of these documents. I'm going to take Homer's Iliad, for instance. Homer's Iliad has about 600 or 1,800 overall, some 643 old and 1,800 new. So over 1,800 total documents that were written 800 years after he supposedly wrote them. Does that make sense? So over 1,800 documents for Homer's Iliad, written over 800 years after he supposedly wrote them. And yet we teach them in our high schools and universities. We don't question them. We give them as, as they are, that this is what he wrote. This is the way he wrote it. This is why he wrote it, and nobody denies it. Let me give you another example. We have uh, Plato. Plato has 210 210. Caesar has 251. So I'm just giving you a couple of examples uh, of some, some fairly historically sound names and people that you would be familiar with and the documents that we have and the time gap between the, the time that those things were written by the person and the time that we have actual documents on those things. Okay. And nobody questions it, and it's all good. When you get to the Bible, remember I told you Homer is about the closest. There's 1,800 written within about 800 years. When we get to the Bible, within around 130 years or less of Jesus' life and the apostles' life, within about 130 years, we have just in the Greek New Testament, just in the Greek New Testament, we have 5,838 documents written within the first 130 years or less of their existence. In the Old Testament, we don't have a time gap, but we have over 18,524 documents to resemble and reflect the Old Testament canonized scripture. Okay? Total Old Testament, that was just Greek, oh, I'm sorry, that was Greek New Testament and then a Greek time cap. In the Old Testament, we have over 42,000 documents. Okay? For a total, a total of scriptural biblical documents, total biblical manuscripts as historical evidence, we have 66,362 documents. Okay, let me put that in a visual perspective for you. If we took the best average of the, all the other historical documents that we have for Homer, Aristotle, etc., etc., and we stacked them up, they would be about four feet tall. If we stacked them up, they'd be about, I'm right at six foot. With these shoes, I'm, I'm right there. And so about four feet tall, okay, that would be, this, that's a pretty good stack of documents. I mean, if you just had a bunch of papers, okay. If you just take the New Testament documents and you stack them up, they are higher than the Twin Towers. If you take the Old Testament and the New Testament 
and all the biblical evidence that we have in today's canonized scripture, and you stack them up, they would be two and a half miles high. And yet the Bible is the most controversial historical document on the face of the earth. Why? Because it says things that people don't want to hear. That's the only reason. If this was just a feel-good book, nobody would have a problem with it. If it was just a better you for this life and nothing else, there'd be no issue. But because it's so much more, because Jesus claimed that he was the only way. You see how we're going in? Hey, brother, I'm going to need you to pick a seat, my man. Pick a seat, okay? Sit still for me. Good. Stay right there for me. We have no other historical document that even remotely measures up to what Scripture is able to accomplish and able to do. And we have God's story from Genesis to Revelation and all the way through. But throughout that Scripture, we have this distraction of God requiring obedience from man in order to receive what he has. And most people don't like that. Jesus makes this, at that time, astronomical claim. He says, I am the bread of life. I am the resurrection. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am, okay? The same words that God the Father used in the burning bush whenever Moses asked, who do I tell the people that you are? The Father said, tell them I am. Jesus came into earth and made the same claim. Okay, We're talking about Jesus being the Son of God. And this is very conversational. It's very teachy. I don't even know if I'll be able to complete it, much less really go off and preach real fun like I like to tonight. But we have this claim that Jesus said, I'm not just a good man. I'm not just a good moral teacher. I am the Son of God. In fact, Jesus said, I am the only one that knows the Father. No one knows the Father except the Son. And no one knows the Son except for the Father. Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Jesus said, I am the only way to the Father. You must go through me in order to get to him. His claim was one of a kind. And we take issue as mankind with Jesus' claim for the same reason that we would do it again today. If somebody came claiming that they were the Son of God, I would take issue with it. Well, they did too. Especially this group of people known as the Jews who were known for their monotheism, okay? This is important because Jesus didn't come to the Egyptians or the Greeks or as an Egyptian or as a Greek and, and decide to join the club with all the rest of their polytheistic or multiple faith systems towards a God. Jesus came as a Jew, the one group of people from Abraham on who were known for their faith in the one true God. And Jesus came and said, I am he, and he is me. I am the Son of God. So, Jesus goes, he proves himself, we'll get to that. But you fast forward, and today we have this argument. C.S. Lewis popularized it. But he is not the one that originated it. It's called the trilemma. Okay? The trilemma is very simply this. And again, all this is in the notes. If you want to write down, I'm, I'm going slow on purpose. 
But the trilemma is very simply that Jesus' claims caused him to be one of three things. Because of everything that I just told you, Jesus had to be one of these three things. He was either Lord as he said he was. He was a liar who knew he was making something up. Or he was a lunatic that believed he was a god. You cannot take those things out that Jesus said about himself and simply call him a good moral teacher. The first place that we see this was actually written by a converted rabbi named John Duncan in 1796. He formulated this trilemma. Let me read what he said. Christ is either has either deceived mankind by conscious fraud. In other words, he was a liar. Or he was himself deluded and self-deceived. Or, number three, he was divine. He was who he said he was. There is no getting out of this trilemma. It is what it is. Now, in 1936, Watchman Nee made a similar argument in his book. If you just like these kind of things, it's called Normal Christian Faith. But then C.S. Lewis popularized it in his book, Mere Christianity. C.S. Lewis, in 1942, here's the argument as expressed. He says, I am trying here to prevent anyone saying the really foolish thing that people often say about him. Him is Jesus. I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher. But I do not accept his claim to be God. That is the one thing we must not say. We cannot call Jesus a good moral teacher. We cannot do that. We must accept his claim to be God. That is the one thing we must not say about him. A man who said the sort of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on a level with the man who says he is a poached egg. I don't know why I use that as an illustration, but it's amusing. Or else he would be the devil of hell, claiming to be God, knowing that he wasn't. You must make your choice. Listen, you must make your choice. You must make your choice. You must believe that he is either a liar, a lunatic, or he is Lord. There is no room for a great moral teacher who made the claims that Jesus made. So he continues, either this man was and is the son of God or else he was a madman or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool, and this was the popular piece. You can shut him up for a fool, you can spit at him and kill him as a demon, or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God, but let us not come with any patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He has not left that open to us. He did not intend to. It's just not who he was. And again, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. That is a, that is a one-of-a-kind claim. And I read this, the text, or, or, or I referenced the text in Matthew chapter 11 earlier this, or this Sunday that Jesus made the claim that no one knows the Son except for the Father. No one knows the Father except for the Son. In fact, not only is he saying that he was God, but he's saying that no one that has ever existed in the history of mankind knows the Father the way that I do and knows me the way that he does because we are, we are one. We are one. If you've seen me, you've seen him. There is no room. There is one final argument. It's not part of the trilemma, but it's that Jesus was not Lord, liar, or lunatic. He was just a really great first century legend. Okay, I'm going to get to that a little bit more. It probably won't be until next week at this pace because I'm trying not to just preach you confused tonight. 
And I'm trying, my objective is, I'm not attempting to, to convince you. It's not my objective. What I'm trying to do tonight is equip you to have this conversation. Specifically with people that are maybe agnostic, so they believe that there's possible, it is possible that there may be a God. Or they are atheists where they say, I, I don't believe in any type of higher power. I don't believe in a God. I believe in this and that's it. So if you can have this conversation, you can, listen, you don't have to go out into public and stand on one leg and call it faith only. Okay? Now listen, without faith, it's impossible to please God. I get that. We are saved by grace through faith. But you can have an educated conversation. And as I'm doing with you right now, if you just take the time to learn just a, a half a page of notes, you can present the case that you can actually prove beyond reasonable doubt that Jesus was who he said he was and the Bible is true. It is a reliable, historically accurate source written by eyewitnesses in the presence of other eyewitnesses that report supernatural events in fulfillment of specific prophecies, not given by man, but divine in power. You can have that conversation because you have the evidence the, the legend theory. If Jesus were just a legend, we're going to get back to this. But everyone that followed him was willing to die for the lie. If Jesus were just a legend, every one of them suffered a terrorist death in order to continue to stake claim to the legend that they made up. Not only is that a little bit tough to believe that all of them, none of them, would deny him. And I'm going to get back to that. But not only is that tough to believe, but also you have to remember, as I already stated, that we are talking about Jewish people. Jewish people who believed in one True God. We're not talking about polytheistic or individuals who believe in multiple beings or multiple gods. One over here, one over healing, one over crops, one over finances, one over, one over, one over. They believe in one true God. And yet these people, this group of individuals was willing to essentially commit treason against their one true God and create a legendary story about some man that came to earth. It's just not reasonable. That's why I say you can have an educated conversation and you can prove beyond reasonable doubt through logic alone that Jesus was who he said he was. And the Bible is the inspired word of God. It was written by eyewitnesses in the presence of other eyewitnesses. Second Peter chapter 1. Is this okay? Okay, I feel like, I feel like Pastor Rick a little bit. Y'all. <laughs> I see the little emoji with his head about halfway up and smoke coming out of the sides. Second Peter chapter 1, verse 16. One of his disciples says, I just want to make sure you understand, we're not making up clever stories as if, as if a first century fisherman, this is not an educated man, this is a first century fisherman, he's, he's not a Pharisee, he's not a Sadducee, he's not, he's not the Jewish elite, he's a fisherman, he hasn't gone to the prophet's school and been raised and trained in the temple. But this first century fisherman had the wisdom enough to address something that would be argued over on university campuses in 2019. I don't know. It impresses me. For we were not making up clever stories when we told you about the powerful coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. We saw, we saw his majestic splendor with our own eyes. 
verse 17. When he received honor and glory from God the Father, the voice from the majestic glory of God said to him, This is my dearly loved son who brings me great joy. They heard the father's voice. It's why they were willing to give their lives and make the claims that they made. Verse 18, we ourselves heard that voice from heaven when we were with him on that holy mountain. God took them up. Jesus took them up. There are. This is the next phase in the presence of eyewitnesses. Okay? There are over 360 prophecies from Genesis to Malachi. Over 360. If I'm not mistaken, there's 366. But I know there's over 360. Some scholars differentiate what they believe and which one was or wasn't. But anyways. And Jesus fulfilled every single one of them. They were prophecies about the coming Messiah in the Old Testament. And Jesus perfected fulfilling every single prophecy that was given about him. Now, some people would say, well, he knew what they were. I mean, he knew the Old Testament. He had the Old Testament. First of all, he didn't have all of it. Um, but that's another. Anyways, he, even if he did, the odds of him perfecting every single prophecy, all 360 plus prophecies, would be, from what I've been told, and you can look this up on your own time, but it would be like filling up the state of Texas with silver dollars two feet high and finding one. That is the odds of Jesus fulfilling Approximately six to eight to however many some people believe years. I'm more of a six to eight kind of a guy. 6,000 years, 360 plus prophecies would be like filling that state up with silver dollars two feet high and finding the one that you were looking for. And yet Jesus fulfilled them perfectly in 33 years. 6,000 years, 360 plus prophecies, and he fulfilled every single one of them in 33 years. One of my favorite is actually in Genesis chapter 3. It's in verse 15, and this is, you've heard me preach this before. I think I actually brought this up around Christmas. I call this the, the seed of the woman prophecy, which is... Um, yeah, most of our children are not in here. I won't go too far, but I just want you to understand that, that woman does not have seed. Biology 101, that's all I'm saying. That is not supposed to be, okay? But listen to this scripture in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. This is God not cursing them, but pronouncing the curse that they and Lucifer in the form of a serpent, have brought upon themselves. God, speaking to the woman, says, or speaking to the serpent, says, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. You're going to strike him and trip him up, but he's going to crush your head. This was the prophecy in Genesis chapter 3, right after the fall of man, where God began to declare his plan for man's redemption through the virgin birth of a woman one time in the history of existence. One woman receiving and having a seed inside of her. He skipped over the man went straight to the woman and the virgin birth took place. The miraculous, prophetic, Genesis chapter 3, virgin birth. Many prophecies, had he only been a man, he would have never been able to fulfill. Let me show you another 
prophecy of the virgin birth. Isaiah 7 verse 14. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. Okay, now we're going back to who he said he was. Meaning, God with us. It's prophesied in Isaiah and confirmed in the Synoptic Gospels. I'm going to have to continue this next week. But the deity of Jesus, hear me, is at the most something that can only be discussed. It cannot be denied. You have to remove historical accuracy, archaeological evidence, reason, logic, and philosophy in order to believe that Jesus was not the Son of God. He was simply a great prophet. He was simply a good man. As, by the way, Islam, Jehovah's Witness, and Mormonism specifically, many more, but those three specific that we would all be familiar with, as they all teach. And if we believe that he was the Son of God, then listen, hear me then we can believe that what he said was true in every area. And here's what he said that we're going to close with tonight. Not if you've heard my word, but if you're a doer of my word. Not if you've been to a service or said a prayer before. Although we believe, we do believe that that has to begin with confession. But if you believe the word of God and you believe that Jesus was the son of God, then if you learn how to love him the way that he loves you, then you will keep his commandments. In other words, his life will be reflected in yours. And I have given you a very simple way to remember that God set this thing up on purpose And gave a lot of evidence to prove that he was who he said he was from Genesis to Malachi. And then he proved over 360 times in 33 years that Jesus really was the coming Messiah. He didn't come in the form that they expected, but he came nonetheless. Listen, he's not coming back in the form that many people expect, but he's coming back nonetheless. Will he find me being the one that is continuing in his word and is a faithful hearer and doer? Doer of his word, or will I be a forgetful hearer and a spectator? He is, he was, he will forever be the Son of God. Next week, we're going to dive into a few more of the prophecies, and specifically, not just how you can prove the Bible and the deity of Jesus, but How you can take the resurrection. Some of you have heard this before. But you can take the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And again, beyond reasonable doubt, in a logical conversation with anyone educated at any level, prove that Jesus resurrected from the dead. You can do that. You can have that conversation. You can equip yourself To not be intimidated by someone who does not believe what you believe. And listen, when you're not intimidated, you won't feel like you have to defend the gospel. You will simply be able to discuss your faith. And by the way, a discussion is always way more convincing than a defense. A defense makes it seem like you're not convinced. But a discussion is a sharing of conviction. And it convince, convicts and convinces the one who hears it. Let's pray. Father, God, I just pray that if there's anybody in this room right now or listening online, and even the ones that are in this room, maybe they know someone. Lord, I pray that if there's anybody in here that 
and has maybe had a struggle in their faith or uh, maybe they have doubted your word or even the words of Jesus. God, I pray that we would see the evidence. But I also pray that we would be sensitive to your spirit. Because we can prove with carnality and education all day long. But God, if we need a sign to believe, then we're going to have a hard time even believing the sign. So Holy Spirit, I pray that you would help us in places that history and archaeology, philosophy and science can't. God, that you would open up our minds to receive and understand. That you would convict us by your spirit to realize that apart from you, we are absolutely nothing, but in you we can do all things. So Lord, right now, if there's anybody in here that needs to receive salvation, I pray that they would just whisper this prayer in their heart. Jesus, forgive me for not believing. Help me to follow you with all of my heart. Take my life and make it yours. I believe you died on the cross and you were raised from the dead. And you gave your life so that I could live. Lord, help me to live it for you. In Jesus' name. Hey, before you go, I want to challenge you to go back. If you cannot pray with someone and lead them to Jesus, I want you to go back and listen to that maybe 12-second, four-sentence prayer that I just made. And if you will learn that prayer, just like I memorized that the Bible is a reliable source of blah, 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 blah. If you will just simply learn, not just memorize, but learn that simple prayer or one similar to it, then you never again have to be afraid to pray someone into a relationship with Jesus, to lead them and help them if they don't know how to do it themselves.